Hi everybody, I'm Jordan Rolfes from Beagle Rampant Productions and the other day I was looking at some of my older videos and I noticed something for the video where I discussed the plot and symbolism of Richard Wagner's fifth completed opera Tannhäuser that that video garnered a lot of positive response and feedback. I enjoy positive response and feedback and I enjoy talking about opera. That doesn't necessarily mean this video is going to get any positive feedback in response, but regardless, we're going to take a look at some more of Wagner's operas here, particularly Rienzi, The Last of the Tribunes. This was Wagner's third completed opera, and the only major success he had throughout his lifetime. The opera is based off of the novel by English writer Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton, and uh, the opera and the novel share the same name. Uh, often they're just shortened to Rienzi. And the name Bulwer Lytton may not have as much of a punch nowadays as it did in the past, but I know you are familiar with some of his quotes. The pen is mightier than the sword, and it was a dark and stormy night. Bulwer often has this reputation of being an overly pompous and wordy and sometimes just not that good of a writer. I don't necessarily think this criticism is fair. There are portions, of course, in his writing where you just want to take a drill to your skull. It's that roundabout and heavy-handed. And there are other times you just want to cling on to every comma he writes because he captures an event and the psychology of a character so beautifully. So today we're going to take a look at Wagner's opera Rienzi and how that matches up with Bulwer's novel. And both the opera and the novel are based on an actual historical figure, Cola di Rienzo, a 14th century Roman leader who rose to power to sort of combat the corrupt nobility of his day. And the opera takes substantial liberties with the novel, and the novel sometimes takes substantial liberties with actual history. And, uh, I mean, there's quite a lot to discuss here. You'll see me looking at uh, my notes quite a bit throughout this video. There's a lot to discuss, and I want to make sure I uh, capture all of the important points here, so... You will see a lot of me looking down. I'll try to keep eye contact with the camera. And it'll be a long video, because we have... And let me just start out by saying it. This version, this print of the novel, you may want to avoid it, because there are a lot of spelling and grammar errors, and things that really should be written in verse form are written in prose, so... Maybe stay clear of this particular rendition of Rienzi. It's um, public domain, so anyone could pop on Project Gutenberg and do their own printing. But as you can see, these are big pages and little words there. So this is going to be a bit of a longer video, and I'm bad about rambling anyway. So grab a snack, sit back, relax, and we are going to take a look at Rienzi, the opera, the novel, the history, and all of the fun drama that happened back in 14th century Rome. So the opera was written between 1838 and 1840, mostly when Wagner was the musical director in Riga, Latvia. And Rienzi is a grand opera, which means it has five acts and a ballet. This style was perfected by a fellow German composer, Giacomo Meyerbeer. Meyerbeer was the most celebrated composer of his time, and 
he saw a lot of potential in the young Wagner, so Meyerbeer helped Wagner finance the first production of Rienzi and even helped him secure a premiere in Dresden in 1842. And people sometimes facetiously refer to Rienzi as Meyerbeer's best opera, and there are times when you listen to Rienzi it's hard to tell, am I listening to Wagner or am I listening to Meyerbeer, but the reason why Wagner is such a force to be reckoned with and why we know his name is largely attributed to Giacomo Meyerbeer. Of course, Wagner goes off on a huge anti-Semitic tirade against Meyerbeer and things get absolutely cringy, but that's a subject for another video at a later date there. And Wagner actually tried to meet Bulwer to discuss the draft and preparation of the opera during a visit to London, but Wagner's poor command of the English language and the fact that Bulwer wasn't in town when Wagner was there made that meeting not super fruitful, and that is just one of many stories that are just kind of cringy during Wagner's time in England. You know, come to think of it, Wagner's life has a lot of cringy and yikes moments to it. Hmm. And I myself don't know if Bulwer ever actually saw the opera. If you look at Bulwer's travel schedule and you look at the performance history of Rienzi, the two don't really match up and I'm unaware of any commentary or review that Bulwer gave of the opera, so... It could be out there, and it's possible he saw it. it. I'm just not aware of any interpretations or takes he had on the production. And the opera is also influenced by Mary Russell Mitford's 1828 play called Rienzi, but for brevity, we're going to go ahead and just compare Bulwer and Wagner, and that also covers up the fact that I didn't read the play. And... One final note here, so there is no definitive version of this opera. The original manuscripts were lost in the Second World War during the Dresden bombing and in Hitler's bunker. Hitler, in his warped and perverted mind, viewed himself as sort of a second reincarnation of Rienzi. So he took possession of the manuscripts and they have since been lost and during Wagner's lifetime. The opera went through several redactions and edits. There was a period where the opera was given over two nights and Wagner later on abandoned the project. He didn't really view Rienzi in that high of a regard. So there isn't one particular version that is the definitive one. A lot of people like the Downs version from 1976 uh, performed by the BBC, and it's good, I, I like it, but there are times I legit think that they just hit copy and paste. It almost borders on repetitive. Everything's in there, but everything's in there two, three, maybe five times. I myself enjoy the Heinrich Holreiser version from 1976 in Dresden, and most of the key passages were reconstructed in the 1970s, so anything before the 70s and after the war, it's going to be heavily abridged, and if you're looking to start listening and enjoying Rienzi, I recommend checking out the whole Riser version. It is thorough, but not rambling. So, you know, it's not like me in that respect, you know? And going to the comparison, there are three very important characters that appear all throughout the novel, and they aren't anywhere in the opera. We have Nina Di Raselli, who was Rienzi's wife, Angelo Villani, who is Rienzi's orphan page, and the knight from Provence, France, uh, Walter de Montreal, also known as the Knight of St. John and Fra Moreale. I am going to use those three titles to refer to him interchangeably. 
But when I do, just realize I'm talking about the same person, and he's a wild card figure that is against Rienzi because his main goal is to conquer Rome. And he also has a bastard child that he believes to be dead. And yes, this is going exactly where you think it is. So, going on to the opera. The... Opera isn't widely performed, Rienzi isn't really officially in the Bayreuth repertoire, and you don't see too many performances of the opera these days. But the overture, the really awesome, exciting overture, that receives uh, several performances in concerts and recitals, and it has been recorded extensively, so... And chances are, you probably have heard the overture in some other form of media. It's very famous, wildly popular, and I just love it. It gets me pumped and excited. I love this overture. Absolutely amazing. Probably among my favorite Wagner overtures. And after the amazing overture, we are taken to the first act. The year is 1347, and on a Roman street we can see the Basilica of St. John Lateran in the background with Rienzi's house in the foreground. Paolo Orsini, head of the noble Orsini family, is leading his men to Rienzi's house where they want to rape his sister Irene. And Stefano Colonna, head of the rival noble family, shows up with his men to thwart them, and Adriano di Castello, who is Stefano's son in the opera, so literally right off the bat we have a discrepancy with the book. Adriano is not Stefano's son, but be that as it may. Adriano appears with some armed men, and the Orsinis and Colonna do battle. Adriano is able to rescue Irene from the horrible act that the Orsini wished to commit. And here's an important note as well about how the opera was scored. There's no definitive version of Rienzi, but Wagner wrote this role of Adriano for the soprano in travesti. And any gender studies majors looking for a slow pitch softball for a term paper? Why not the soprano and travesti there? Basically, it's a female singer playing the role of a male character. Now, I know there are some recordings that have Adriano performed by a tenor or baritone, but in the original premiere in Dresden, it was a female soprano and everything was scored for soprano, so... And going back to the story of the opera there, Raimondo, the Bishop of Orvieto, demands that they stop in the name of God. The nobles on both sides uh, give some fun little blasphemy. Hey, preacher, give your preachings in the church, not here on the streets. And the people of Rome uh, have arrived, and they're absolutely shocked by all of this violence and bloodshed between the nobles, and by their just straight-up blasphemy and disrespect for a man of the cloth here. In a dramatic key change, now, I'm not a music or even a Wagner scholar, it really begs the question, why am I making this video? But in a dramatic key change, Rienzi appears and stops the riot. I mean, you don't have to be a musical expert to know. Okay, here comes Rienzi. It is very obvious. And the people are enchanted by Rienzi's charisma and his promise of the future, but the nobles dismiss him as a madman. Here Rienzi drops some very important recitative. Now, recitative is an operatic uh, technique where thing, exposition, things, uh, things that would normally be spoken are sung because, you know, it's opera, and these are things that are crucial to your understanding of the story and the character's motives, and they are sung in beautiful melodic rendering here. Italy in general, and Rome in particular, have to answer to a foreign emperor in Germany, that would of course be the Holy Roman Empire, and the feuding between the noble families has left the city lawless, and hired thugs from the north are extorting and manipulating the people without any sort of regard for 
human decency, and the Pope has had to take refuge in Avignon, putting the church in serious danger of losing the seat of the Apostle. So I'm a Roman Catholic, and Roman is the first word in my faith there, so the fact that the church is in serious danger of losing Rome is pretty significant, so it's a bad state for Italy in general, and Rome specifically here. The people love Rienzi's stance on this, and they leave excited, and the nobles disperse. They're concerned about Rienzi. This guy is a definite wild card here. And now we have Rienzi, Adriano, and Irene left alone. Rienzi thanks Adriano for rescuing Irene, and he asks for Adriano's support in the restoration of Rome. Adriano, he is, of course, torn between a country and family here. And when I say country, we also have to bear in mind each area of Italy sort of viewed themselves as kind of their own country. So Tuscany sort of viewed themselves as a separate country from Milan and from Rome. So there was that division on top of being ruled by the Holy Roman Emperor there. Rienzi uses this opportunity to slam Adriano with some more recitative. Rienzi's little brother was killed by a Colonna when they were in battle with the Orsini, and Rienzi asks Stefano for justice, and his response was, eh, nothing can be done. I mean, if it was an Orsini spear, oh yes, we would go to the ends of the earth to make sure your brother receives justice, but since it was a Colonna spear... Sucks to be you, man. Sorry for your loss. Rienzi departs, and now Adriano is alone with Irene. They share a beautiful duet on their newfound love and the hope of Rome. A world of suffering makes sweet the joys of love. A horn sounds, and the day has begun to dawn, and the people of Rome are flocking to the Lateran. The Setz Van Holm version from 1960 in Vienna, conducted by Josef Krips, has an awesome organ solo at this part. I have extensive criticisms about that rendition of the opera, but man, that organ is big and booming and gothic, and it is sweet in every last aspect of the word. Mmm, that is some good sugar right there. Anyway, Rienzi gives a speech to the people that a new day has dawned in Rome, and their oppression is at an end. Cecco del Vecchio, the blacksmith, and Francesco Baroncelli, and the political demagogue and opportunist, want Rienzi to be crowned the king of Rome, but Rienzi doesn't want to take a title that is going to put him above the people, so he says, no, make me the tribune of Rome. The people gladly accept, and... There's a beautiful rendition of the chorus. Uh, act one ends in fabulous splendor. So how does act one of the opera match up with the book? It actually does it kind of nicely. As I mentioned, Adriano is not Stefano's son. And Irene's rape attempt happened at the hands of Martino di Porto of the Orsini house. And Rienzi will remember this. Rienzi's relationship with Nina is often used in contrast to Irene and Adriano's relationship. Adriano are youthful and idealistic and in many ways star-crossed. Adriano is torn between his house and his family and his love for his country and the love for his lady there. And Rienzi and Nina's relationship is definitely an older and more almost somber and mature one. And it's their ambition sort of serves to complement their relationship. The better Rienzi does, the better his relationship with Nina does. So Raimondo was very excited about bringing Rienzi to power because a jubilee year was slated for the year 1350. Basically, the jubilee year was a celebration enacted by Dante's great enemy, Pope Boniface VIII, and it has a lot of roots within pagan traditions. 
wait a minute. So you're telling me the Catholic Church would use things that were rooted in pagan tradition? This is the first I'm hearing of this, man. But anyway, the previous Jubilee year was really successful. Pilgrims from all over the world would visit the different churches and shrines and donate money to receive what is called a plenary indulgence. And a rude oversimplification of a plenary indulgence is um, time off for the sins that you've committed. And the priests and monks had to ra use rakes to bring in all the gold coins that those pilgrims were dropping. But... With the current political situation in Italy, that was looking kind of grim for the Jubilee year, so Raimondo wanted a figure that could bring about stability and peace, and he saw that in Rienzi. Walter de Montreal, whose main goal, as I mentioned, was to take control of Rome, was very supportive of Rienzi at the outset. He looked at Rienzi and realized, hey, this guy is good at controlling and manipulating the people here. And initially, he was trying to get in communication with Rienzi so that they could come to power together. Of course, Rienzi is proclaimed tribune before Walter de Montreal can get in there, because Rienzi, rightfully so, does not trust Walter de Montreal. Throughout the book, we see that Francis Petrarch is a huge supporter of Rienzi, and Spirito Gentile, while it doesn't expressly say it, is so obviously written in dedication to Rienzi. Rienzi's new government is called the Buono Stato, and not really mentioned in the opera, but there are occasions where I'll just refer to Rienzi's government in that respect, just because it's easier. And before the events that make up Wagner's second act, Walter de Montreal visits Adriano, who tells him of his unwedded love with the noble lady of Naples, Adeline. And she bore him a son who was kidnapped and now, Walter believes, is dead. And yes, this is going exactly where you think it is. Moving on to Act 2 of the opera. This act takes place in a great hall of the capital and peace envoys from all of the noble families and some foreign ambassadors are arriving and the peace envoys from the noble families are pledging themselves to Rome's newfound freedom. In both the book and the opera, Rienzi shows a definite love for pageantry and performances, and I can't help but wonder, is this sort of like bread and circus here? It really seems to me like this is bread and circus. The leadership of the Orsini and Colonna families are distressed by the new turn of events, and they plot to assassinate Rienzi. Adriano tries to dissuade them, but they pay him no attention. That's going to pop up a lot throughout the opera here. And Rienzi makes a proclamation that Italy will no longer be subject to the rules of the German Empire, but rather those of Rome. And of course, the Italian nobles and the foreign ambassadors are straight up freaking out here. And to celebrate this proclamation, a ballet is held, and the theme is ancient Rome coming together with the modern Rome, the Buono Stato. In the original premiere, this went on for over half an hour, and usually now it is reduced in recordings and performances, but the 1976 BBC version, conducted by Edward Downs, mostly has uh, as much of the original ballet as you possibly could. And it's also interesting that this ballet in Rienzi actually complements the action of the story. Usually in grand opera, ballet is some really sweet dance moves complemented with some really awesome music, but here it serves as a complement and is directly related to the action going on in the story. During the ballet, Orsini and some of the nobles approach Rienzi to try to stab him, but the Tribune is protected by a vest of chainmail. The people demand the execution of the nobles, and Rienzi agrees, yeah, they committed this crime and death is the punishment here. 
Adriano and Irene beg Rienzi to have mercy and spare the lives of the nobles. Rienzi eventually agrees, but he has to convince the people of this. In the opera, Rienzi does this by saying, if you love me, you would agree to pardon these nobles. In the book, Rienzi actually invokes the mercy of Jesus, so call to mind the mercy that the great Redeemer has shown us. The people eventually agree that the nobles should be spared. Cecco and Baroncelli are mummering to themselves, oh no, those nobles are going to walk all over him, and the nobles are over there murmuring, oh yeah, we are totally going to walk all over him. Adriano and Irene lead the general acclamation that concludes this act of the opera. Moving on to how this act matches up with the book, sorry for really hanging on to my note crutch here, and for all the inconsistencies, it's really hot and I need to wipe the sweat off myself. Yeah. There's absolutely no air in my studio today, but regardless, how Act 2 matches up with the book here. To start everything out, Angelo Villani leaves Ursula, the lady who was raising him. He's really excited about the Buono Stato and all of the great things Rienzi is going to do. You know how young boys are, so he's really excited to join the service of Rienzi. And oftentimes, what Rienzi and Nina would do would be to have uh, huge open houses where they would uh, meet and mingle with the local people, and Ursula decides, okay, maybe he could be a page in Lady Nina's service here. So she has an audience with Nina, and Nina is instantly captivated by Angelo, so she gladly takes him into her service. Now, while Rienzi pardons the nobles, he does hang Martino di Porto, who tried to rape his sister, so, you know, couldn't happen to a nicer guy, but here's an important part about that. Martino di Porto is the nephew of a cardinal, so a cardinal is pretty much one step below the Pope. It's a level of bishop in the Catholic Church, and basically when a Pope dies, all of the Cardinals come together amongst each other and vote amongst themselves as to who would be the next successor of that Pope, and really St. Peter himself, the very Apostle of Jesus Christ there. So Wagner had to condense several different episodes into one to be brief. In the book, Rienzi was actually being knighted into the order of the Santo Spirito, and in the day of his coronation, he bathes in the porphyry vase used by Emperor Constantine back when he was still a heathen before his conversion. That becomes important later on there. And his assassination attempt actually occurred that evening during the watching of the armor, which apparently was really important in, like, England and Germany, but yeah, maybe not as rigidly observed in Italy. And Rienzi's assassination attempt was not from a noble, but by a hired Saxon, who totally rats out the nobles who hired him. And after Rienzi pardons them, just like how he does in the opera, Stefano Colonna sends letters all over the place to Pope Clement VI, to the opposing demagogue John Di Vico, and to other nobles to sort of help plan an attack on Rome and to take back their city. Now we move on to Act 3 of the opera here. We're in the square of the Roman Forum. Baroncelli, Cecco, and the people are clamoring. The nobles are at the gate, ready to attack, and Rienzi realizes he was wrong to pardon them, but they're going to prepare for battle and show no mercy in defending their city. Adriano is now in a hopeless situation. He doesn't want to betray his family, but at the same time, his belief in the Bono Stato and his love for Irene demand that he stay loyal to Rienzi. He's pretty hopeless in this point, so he prays to God that the two opposing sides can reconcile. I absolutely love the interlude as rendered by Heinrich Holreiser. It's so great, it gets my blood pumping, and 
I'm, I myself am ready to walk out the door and do battle, and let me tell you, that gave the mailman something of a crazy start there. <laughs> I'm too crazy for this. Anyway, Adriano makes one last appeal to Rienzi, but Rienzi won't hear of it, and Rienzi's forces march into battle. Their cry is, Santo Spirito Cavalier. And I adore, in the 1957 version featuring my favorite Helden tenor, Wolfgang Wingassen, I've not heard this particular passage in any of the other versions, but the soldiers just cry out Santo Spirito as loud as they can for a solid minute, and it is awesome. I absolutely love it, and while the 1957 Stuttgart version of the opera has a lot of problems, this part is actually really, really cool, and I adore it. Adriano and Irene despair as the battle rages on, and the women of Rome pray for the safety of their loved ones. Rienzi returns, announcing victory, and now the women's song turn into one of praise. Adriano and Irene, though, are maybe not as spirited as the rest of the women of Rome. Adriano then recognizes his father. <laughs> Stefano Colonna is one of the fallen and lets out an anguished cry. And while this was a victory for the Romans, Baroncelli and Cecco del Vecchio realize there were heavy casualties on their side. It was a victory, but is it a victory worth a whole lot of celebration? Because there were heavy losses here. Adriano swears a re revenge upon Rienzi, and of course Rienzi dismisses him as a madman because that's just how you treat Adriano, I guess. And Rienzi proclaims that a Thanksgiving Mass, a Te Deum, should be said for the victory. Te Deum laudamo, so we praise you, O oh God. And that's Act 3, so how does Act 3 compare with the rest of the book? Here's where we actually start to see some of the discrepancies. While a lot of Colonas were killed in the battle at the gate, the Elder Stefano was not one of them. Wikipedia, I don't care what you have to say, Stefano Colonna was not one of them, but in Wikipedia's defense, there are sources that kind of erroneously say the Elder Colonna was killed in the battle, but that actually was not the case. The book even somewhat contradicts actual history. Rienzi was pretty barbarous uh, before going into this battle, including performing acts of cruelty to animals. And it's also interesting to note, in another volume selection by Bulwer, The Last of the Barons, for some reason Bulwer likes to talk about the last things of things, but in The Last of the Barons, the Earl of Warwick, right before he's going to battle against English King Edward IV, tells his troops, Remember, these are your countrymen. Show mercy where you can, and be kind and gentle. Rienzi doesn't make any such appeal here. Bulwer is creating Rienzi to be a romantic hero. Bulwer even says in one of the appendices that his faults just make his character all the better. So we have a kind of idealized version here. Actual history is sort of indicating Rienzi was very unnecessarily cruel and brutal during this battle. And if the actual history uh, contradicts Bulwer's idealized version, Bulwer just tends to ignore it. I mean, I'm not really an expert. I'm really only familiar with the opera and the novel, but in some of my research for some of these other notes, I did come across that, that Rienzi was by no means the perfect man that Bulwer sometimes is making him out to be. Going back to the story here, Adriano was not present at the battle, but when he returned to Rome later that day and saw the bloody corpses of his kin, he took a sabbatical from his service to Rienzi. He just left Rienzi because 
this is a little too hard. And that also begs the question of Rienzi's brutality here, you know? I, l I love the battle cry of the noble fraction of the Frangipani. For charity and the Frangipani! It's so weird to call out, uh, I'm battling for charity as you're going to slaughter your countrymen. That's just really weird to me, and the phrase actually has kind of an interesting history. So, during a time of great famine, one of the Frangipani shared his last bit of bread with a beggar, so that was how they came across that battle cry. Not super related to what we're talking about, but I think it's cool. After the battle, Rienzi looks to the young Angelo Villani and says, Blessed art thou who hast no blood of kindred to avenge. That's going to become important later on there. And soon after the battle, Rienzi is forced to issue a tax. You know, battles and pageants, uh, they're expensive, man, so... Moving on to Act 4 of the opera, here the action takes place in a square in front of the Lateran. Baroncelli, Cecco de Vecchio, and the concerned citizens are meeting up by an anonymous invitation. Adriano is the one who orchestrated the meeting, and they agree after recent news of the Emperor's wrath and the nobles trying to get Rienzi proclaimed a heretic that Rienzi's gotta go, we gotta overthrow him. And people eventually start arriving for the mass, including Bishop Raimondo, and it's at this point Adriano makes the decision, yeah, I better go ahead and stab Rienzi here. Rienzi arrives with the Irene, and Adriano suddenly thinks, hmm, probably don't want to kill the brother of the girl I want to get lucky with when she's standing right there, so not a good idea, and he loses his nerve. The people start voicing their dissent, and Rienzi questions their strength and begs them a pretty good point here, actually. How many atrocities have the nobles committed to you guys when they were in power? Isn't this a worthy price to pay for your freedom and to be able to walk the streets at night and not get raped? They don't have a good answer for that one. A chorus of monks and priests are coming from the Lateran, giving the eerie chant of Vai, vai, tibi maledicto. Woe, woe to you, accursed. Rienzi, not clearly making out of the actual words, says, Yikes, what kind of a te deum is that? And as Rienzi is approaching the steps of the Lateran, Raimondo prevents him from entering. He and anyone who associates with him is excommunicated. Adriano now tries to convince Irene, hey, you're going to get excommunicated if you keep saddling your wagon to this. So ditch your brother and, you know, cut your losses here. And Irene refuses. She wants to stay loyal to Rienzi. And Rienzi looks at Irene and says, Irene, as long as I still have you, there is still a Rome. As the curtain falls, we hear the eerie chorus of Vai, Vai, Tibi Maledicto. Act 4 is, is pretty awesome at the end there. I, yeah, that, that's some good sugar there. So, how Act 4 matches up with the book? You gotta wonder in Wagner's opera, okay, why is Rienzi getting excommunicated? I guess maybe the nobles were sending letters to the Pope, but... Man, that, that happened kind of quickly. Like, boy, that escalated real fast there. In the actual book, it seems like it was probably more political than anything. Martino di Porto, who Rienzi hung for attempting to rape his sister, was a cardinal's nephew, and Rienzi was having money troubles, and this probably told the leadership of the church, uh, now headquartered in Avignon, that... Hmm, maybe this Rienzi actually isn't the figure to go ahead and get Rome restored for us. And, of course, there was the charge of him bathing in the vase of uh, Constantine when Constantine was still a heathen. Rienzi in the book, though, has a pretty good slam for that. Hey, if it's good enough for a heathen, it's certainly good enough for a Christian and a Catholic. 
After the Bull of Excommunication was written, the nobles attempted to regain the city once more, and Rienzi tried to solic the, solicit the arms of the Romans, but, you know, him being excommunicated, the tax, and the heavy casualties of the previous battle lead the Romans to straight up abandon him. And Baroncelli is instrumental in telling the people to abandon Rienzi. But it's just a couple of ruthless German mercenaries here. Uh, they only slaughtered how many of your loved ones and relatives here? I mean, you might get slaughtered, but hey, Rienzi will be fine, and in the end, isn't that really what matters? So with Baroncelli's words, the people decide we really can't take up arms for Rienzi again. And Rienzi ultimately escapes with Irene and Nina in disguise, and they pass through the midst of the nobles. And of course the nobles retake the city, and they rule with an iron fist. If you so much as look at a noble the wrong way, your head is going to be rolling. Moving on to Act 5 of the opera. The act starts out in a room in the capital. Rienzi is alone, and he prays to God. Almighty Father, hear me. Please do not destroy what your hand has helped me build here. And a lot of the fifth act has been lost. When we say much of the opera is lost, a good chunk of that actually refers to the fifth act here. But this prayer remains intact along with the overture. And I gotta say, the Wolfgang Greengassen version from 1957 in Stuttgart well, there were definitely problems with that recording. It's my favorite Heldon tenor singing the prayer from Rienzi, so absolutely love it. It's just perfect. And after Rienzi says his moving prayer, Irene enters, distressed that she lost a love. Rienzi mentions that he had a bride once too, and I'm actually thinking, oh, does the opera refer to Nina? No, it's just some symbolism. I was married to Rome, and Rome turned their back on me. And ultimately, though, Irene resolves to stay with Rienzi and die a woman and a Roman. Rienzi departs to make one final plea with the people, and Adriano now enters, ashamed of his previous behavior, and pleads once more with Irene, Hey, there's an angry mob outside. You need to ditch your brother. Irene resolves to stay with Rienzi and takes her leave of Adriano, so I guess that's what you would call a breakup, I don't know. The scene then changes to the square in front of the capital. The mob carrying torches is ready to burn down the capital and kill the accursed of the church. Rienzi tries to appeal to them, but Ceco and Berencelli warn the people, don't let him speak. Huh, I actually saw the same thing on Twitter just the other day there. And Rienzi's last words are, As long as the Eternal City does not perish, you will see Rienzi return. In the original version, of course, he cursed the people of Rome, but I guess Wagner thought, Yikes, that's a little harsh, even for me. He went ahead and softened the blow a little bit there. And it's also ironic, because I didn't actually know the name Rienzi before... I was introduced to the opera, and then later introduced to the novel. And ironically, the opera became more famous than the novel, but the opera is not really performed to any great degree, so what does that actually say about the name of Rienzi? I'll leave that to the debate in the comment section there. But the mob eventually burns down the capital, killing Rienzi and Irene. Adriano returns and desperately rushes into the flames to try to rescue Irene in a very much vain attempt. And I absolutely love the ending chorus there, and yeah, everything I just said was actually the ending of the opera, you know, that's as happy an ending as we're going to get here. But man, I love that conclusion of the opera, it's so good. So how does Act 5 match up with the rest of the book? Well, because I've been thinking, huh, this video's too short anyway. Once we hit the beginning of Act 5, we actually have, like, this much 
left of the book. Yeah, so we're only like slightly halfway through the book here, so yeah, quite a bit to cover for the rest of the book here. Adriano searches for Irene in Florence right as the Great Plague is raging, and, you know, kind of a relatable read here in the year 2020, but I do gotta say, maybe I feel a little bit slighted here, because while there was certainly death and sorrow in Florence during the Great Plague, they were also having orgies and crazy parties. Dude, in 2020, we get the death and the misery but we don't have any f crazy parties. All we get is self-righteous social media posts and misinformation. But he spends all of book six discussing how Great Plague ravished Florence and how Adriana was desperately searching for Irene. So if you want to read the book or even read just a little excerpt, definitely check out book six. It will haunt you and also make you feel a little bit slighted here. Fast forward five years, it's now the year 1352, there's a new pope, Innocent VI, and Rienzi is imprisoned at Avignon. Nina and Angelo, in disguise, are on the scene trying to commute his sentence and his excommunication. Cardinal Egidio Albornoz, the ambitious Spanish bishop and founder of the St. Clement College in Bologna, is ultimately convinced to give Rienzi a trial. Walter de Montreal is uh, among the attendees uh, waiting for the verdict of Rienzi's trial, and he meets Angelo Villani, and he feels a strong connection to the lad. Yes, this is going where you think it is. The verdict is pronounced, Rienzi is cleared of all charges, and he will return to Rome two years later. In the meanwhile, Adriano visits the forces of Walter de Montreal, which is also known as the Grand Company. Adriano's visit is used pretty much to describe the interval between Rienzi's acquittal and his return to Rome. Rome was in pretty much a hellish state, as you could have imagined. Francesco Baroncelli assumed a leadership, but he weren't no good at it, so he was defeated and killed by the barons. And other sources actually refer to Rienzi being the one doing a Baroncelli in. Walter de Montreal's brothers are assisting Rienzi in his return in gathering forces for Rienzi's re-entry into Rome, and Rienzi's enemy John de Vico is defeated at Viterbo. We also learn that Adeline, oh, Walter's unwedded lover, died, or in his words, slipped away to heaven. And Walter is now ready for some pretty daring moves, you know, he doesn't have too much to lose at this point. Oh, and uh, Stefano Colonna also died, but um, that's kind of whatever. So, now we meet up with Rienzi in Rome, it's the year 1354, he is proclaimed senator and in the procession to celebrate his new appointment as senator. Adriano notices a lot of hired thugs and ruffians there. The very thing Rienzi promised to defeat, he seems to be relying on. Rienzi sends Angelo Villani to spy on old Fra Moreale, and Adriano offers to go to the Colonna encampment at Palestrina to broker a priest deal with his relatives. And Rienzi says, oh, I actually sent an envoy there myself. Maybe you could go and seal the deal? Yeah, that'll be perfectly fine. At Palestrina, Adriano learns that his relatives are plotting with the other noble families, and Rienzi's herald was thrown into a pig's trough, and they went ahead and ripped out his teeth for good measure. Adriano's response is the correct one, being absolutely horrified at that, and Stefanello Colonna eventually orders that Adriano be imprisoned. Rienzi hears of this, and he is absolutely furious, so he decides to launch a campaign and besiege Palestrina. Initially, the siege 
isn't going too well, and Rienzi learns from Angelo that Walter de Montreal has arrived in Rome. So, Rienzi, he, the brothers of the Knight of St. John, are with Rienzi as they are besieging Palestrina. Rienzi decides, okay, I'm going to take his brothers back to Rome with me here. And in Rome, we can see the Knight of St. John conversing with the other nobles, plotting, okay, how do I go ahead and take over Rome here? And as they're plotting, they hear a death bell going, a bell signaling the execution of someone. Eh, they dismiss it, eh, probably just some common robber. They hear a tumult and footsteps outside. Yeah, probably just the mob coming to witness some of the carnage there. And all of a sudden, Rienzi bursts forth through the door. Well, today, Montreal, you hear the death knell? That one is for you. Well, today, Montreal wants to confront his accuser, so points to Rienzi there. He lets uh, the accused confront their accuser. They bring forth Angelo Villani. Walter de Montreal has uh, three requests, that his brothers be spared, that he be executed by the axe, and that he be granted a St. Augustine confessor. And uh, Rienzi is ready to grant all three of these provisions. Angelo is uh, actually called away because Ursula, the lady who raised him as a young child, was dying and she was giving her final confession. As it turns out, the thing you were thinking totally happened. The Knight of St. John was indeed Angelo Villani's father. Horrified, uh, Angelo wants to stop the execution of his uh, newly discovered father. He's rushing to the execution to try to plead, stop this. Right as he gets there, the Axeman holds up his father's head, so he is clearly too late. Blessed art thou who hast no blood of kindred to avenge. Adria Angelo is now looking for an opening for revenge, so he asks Rienzi to be the captain of the guard of the capital. Rienzi is a little puzzled by this. It's a downgrade from Angelo's current position, but he ultimately agrees. So we now have some more money concerns. Rienzi is compelled to issue a tax on wine and salt. This angers the people of Rome, particularly Ceco del Vecchio. And news comes that Palestrina has actually been conquered. You know, it's interesting. You get the brothers of your enemy away from the battle and then you win? That's really interesting. How about that? And Rienzi is actually in a pretty good mood. His uh, enemy, Fra Morreale, has been decapitated, and his military campaign succeeded. Rienzi is feeling kind of optimistic, and he's in a good position right now. Rienzi will spend that night in prayer, but as opposed to the opera where it is a prayer of desperation, it seems to be a prayer of thanksgiving and rejoicing. And... He mentions that seven seems to be his lucky number because it was seven years between his time as tribune and senator and all of this great news of the conquering of Palestrina has come on the 7th of October, so Rienzi muses that seven must be his lucky number. That following morning, the 8th of October, 1354, Rienzi wakes up to see Angelo and none of the guards are at their post at the capital, and everything is wide open. A mob is ready to burn down the capital, just like how they do in the opera. Adriano appears, saying he has a Northman ready with a boat to bring Rienzi, Irene, and Nina to safety. They refuse. Uh, Adriano is eventually to, able to convince Irene to escape with him. Nina merely waits her death serenely and at peace uh, in the burning building, and Rienzi once again tries to attempt to reason with the people, and as in the opera, their response is, Don't let him speak! He's going to hypnotize you with his weird charm. 
Rienzi leaves the balcony from which he addressed the people, and BOOM! Stab wound gets him to the ground. It's Checo del Vecchio. And BOOM! One more stab wound to go ahead and finish him off. It's Angelo Villani. Blessed art thou who hast no blood of kindred to avenge. Bulwer finishes his novel by having Rienzi die a heroic death in the capital, and all of Rome becomes the funeral pyre for the last of the tribunes. Here again, actual history begs to differ. Rienzi was stabbed multiple times. The building that was set on fire... We don't even know if it actually was uh, the capital, and that was the only building that was affected, the one from where he made his final appeal to the people of Rome. It didn't burn down the entire city. After Rienzi was stabbed multiple times, they kind of made Swiss cheese out of him there, his body was paraded through the streets, where it was pelted with garbage and stones. His body was eventually hung up by hooks, where it was pelted with, you guessed it, garbage and stones. And then eventually they ripped open his body, and whatever was left over, they burned. So this is certainly not a heroic and noble death, and it doesn't match up with Bulwer's idealized version of Rienzi, so he just straight up ignores it. So, what do we actually make of Rienzi? The opera is a beautiful and tragically forgotten early work from Richard Wagner. And there are some absolutely beautiful moments. I love that the overture is still widely performed and discussed and deliberated upon. There are so many great things in this opera. It's a pity it doesn't get shown more love throughout the world. Hopefully that changes and a couple years, you, you never know. The book, even from the infamously wordy Bulwer Lytton, has some passages in it that you just want to cling to. He is great with dialogue and creating a scene and giving a very exciting and captivating plot. And a lot of the wordiness that has been known to plague some of his other novels doesn't really pop up in uh, Rienzi too terribly much. I will say the first chapter of the book kind of sucks, but once you get past the kind of awkward and stilted first chapter, this is a captivating read throughout, so kudos to Bulwer for this wonderful piece here. And what do we make of the actual man, Rienzi? Okay, he did good things. He secured trade, and he made Rome safer for the people, uh, but he was also a demagogue that was all too ready to betray the very foundations he was supposed to support. And he did some very brutal things as both tribune and senator. Gibbon disregards uh, Rienzi as a megalomaniac, because Sir Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, he disregards Rienzi as a megalomaniac, and Bulwer gets really rare uh, about that sort of thing. Uh, he asks, well, what would Gibbon have made of Oliver Cromwell? Well, I'm of a Scottish and Irish descent, and Oliver Cromwell did some pretty horrible things to uh, my kinfolk and people, so, I mean, those are things to keep in consideration here. The real truth is probably actually somewhere in between Gibbon and Bulwer. Rienzi more than likely was better for Rome than the warring nobles who just raped and murdered without any sort of hope of justice or retribution there. And while Rienzi was definitely better than those nobles by bringing a law, order, and sanity to Rome, he did horrible things. If he ran for president or congress, I highly doubt he would get my vote, and in today's world, he probably would be on trial for several human rights violations, but you never know with the way the Human Rights Council of the UN is, he might be appointed their president. Sometimes they've made calls that I'm like, 
are you kidding me? But regardless, the real truth is probably somewhere in between the best possible f thing for Rome at that time, but by and large, you don't want someone like Rienzi governing you today. So the warnings in both the book and the opera are very clear. You need to avoid political fanaticism. Rienzi, while he did good things, was not perfect. The nobles were absolutely brutal. You cannot be slavishly loyal to them. And when they go against the things they are supposed to support and embrace the things they are supposed to be against, you have an obligation to dissent against the leader that you are supposedly in camp with. And of course, you have to avoid mob justice. And that's not to say, the people coming together for a common good and working for a better end, that's good. That should be supported. But when it turns into mob justice and there's a vacuum of power, oftentimes you're going to get something way worse than something... You're going to get the exact opposite of what the mob was actually trying to do. We saw this in when the nobles retook Rome. The people got the exact opposite of what they actually wanted, and they were taxed to oblivion under the nobles. That should also be noted. So, by and large, moderation is key, and in the book, Adriano is the perfect example of moderation, political moderation there. This video has been very long. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this one as much as you enjoyed my Tannhäuser video. I'm so sorry for the lengthiness, but I had a three and a half hour opera to discuss and why that wasn't enough to cover all of this book, but thank you so much for watching. You know you're the best fans of any YouTuber in the world. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Jordan Rolfes from Beagle Rampant Productions. You guys are the best, and we will catch you later with some other videos. Bye! Bye!